Uh, hello, everybody, and today I'm delighted to have a very special person with me. He's uh, the, the person I have actually modeled some part of my life, and uh, I have uh, taken him as a source of motivation in some moments of my life. So I really want to introduce Jack Canfield to you. And Jack, very welcome to London. Thank you. Glad to be here. If I start introducing you today, this program will be just about your introduction. <laughs> And I think it's all, it's still fair to say that uh, you're affectionately known as America's number one success coach. People love you. And I've seen the hits on your YouTube uh, videos of lectures. And not only that, 500 million copies sold for Chicken Soup for the Soul. What is phenomenal? This is phenomenal. It's really, it, is, it even amazes me. Uh, that's a half a billion books. However, we actually set a goal in 1993 when the book came out first that we would sell a billion books by the year 2020. So it was a goal, it was a, an intention, a purpose. And uh, because the Chinese purchased uh, all the rights to all the books in the series, and they use it to teach English in the schools. So they'll put uh, Chinese on one page, the English translation on the other, and they use it to teach English to the kids in school. So over 300 million copies of the books just in China alone. My goodness, yeah. it's phenomenal. It's, it's well, phenomenal. I think you're not using the numbers very well. It's 8 billion people in the world, and I think 50% of them, if you can reach them, and if 10% buy, right. that is already a big number. So you're heading there. And I, can, I think that your 1 billion books sold by 2020 is practical from what we've seen before. Yeah, no, our, my publisher laughed at me when we first told him that goal. He said, he, th he thought we were crazy. He said, we'll be lucky to sell 20,000 copies. And we said, no, we're entrepreneurs. We think we can do better than that. Well, th th that's, that's what the topic is today. That, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have uh, heard about your story. People want to hear more about that. But what I want to ask you today, what I want you to share about today is about a guy, about people who reach success. Mm -hmm. They got a lot in life but they have capacity of much more. So these are, this is the guy, this is the kind of group I want to address today. Sure. People who have achieved success, their ability is recognized, they are known as successful people, but they have potential to go further. So what are the challenges these people face? What are the challenges these people have? What are the obstacles in front of them? I, I know it's a common saying that success can stop further success because you get very busy to grow. But what's, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you get very busy because you're all, you know, to sustain the success you already have takes a lot of energy. And sometimes success also gets in the way of, of further success because you get comfortable. And you go, well, maybe this is enough. Maybe I don't need to do more. However, I don't think that the purpose in life is to be comfortable. I think the purpose in life is to become a master and to grow and to develop. And this is what we're currently, you know, what people are really meant to do is continually evolve. And most, most successful people I meet know that, that they want more. You know, people that come to my seminars tend to be successful people, not people that aren't. But they want to do and experience more. Now, the biggest problem I find with entrepreneurs is they don't realize once they've started a company that what many of them have done is they've really started a job. They have a job running their company instead of using the company to free themselves to go to higher and higher levels. So I always say the first thing you have to do if you want to go to the next level is replace yourself at the current level you are. So whether that's someone in a company, it's a you know, C-level executive, or whether it's an entrepreneur who owns their own company, you know, you've got to find somebody or a team of people, often it takes a team of people, to replace you doing the things you were doing. I'll give you an example. I do these uh, luxury retreats where we'll go to places like um, Tuscany, Italy or Bali and we limit it to 24 people, usually fairly successful people. And we had one guy, he was a multi-multi-millionaire, he was at, I think four companies in his little entourage of uh, things that he was running. The problem was he was miserable because he was working, he was killing himself all the time. So what we said to him is you've got to find people to run those companies for you so you can move up to the next higher level. Like a Richard Branson, you know, he's not running every the op day to day operations of any of his companies anymore. And so he went home and he turned over the running of his companies to two people. He had to hire some new people to come in 
and now he's a, a cycling champion. He literally spends uh, three or four days a week cycling and the rest of the time overseeing his companies. And everyone's doing better because he's not micromanaging everything. And he's, he's making more money and having more fun. So the promise I make people when they study my work is you can have more fun, have more free days, and make twice as much money. And so we have to give up the idea that I'm indispensable. Um, a good friend of mine runs a company in, in America called Chobani Yogurt. He's a, a, came from Turkey, and uh, Greek yogurt was the big deal. And he built the company up to a billion dollars. He won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And all of a sudden, he realized what got him there won't get him to the next level. Yeah. And so, literally, you've got to replace friends who helped you get there, and that's hard. You know, a lot of people don't want to realize the guy who brought me to a billion can't take me to 10 billion. And so that, that loyalty to people that have come with you, that can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and bringing in people that are now managing a big company rather than building a big company is a big challenge. But I think the main thing is to ask yourself on a continual basis, what is my vision of my ideal life? You know, and if, what, if it's what you're currently doing, then fine. But most people always want more. They want more time, they want more money, they want more fulfillment, they want bigger market share, whatever it is. In order to do that, you can't keep doing what you've been doing. There's a formula in my book that I know you know about because I know you've read my book called E plus R equals O. It stands for event plus response equals outcome. And basically two plus two equals four. And if I keep doing two and the world keeps doing two, okay. then I'm gonna get four. However, if I want five, and the world's still doing two, meaning you know the world is the way it is out there, I've got to do something called three in order to get five. Well, that three is going to require me to be uncomfortable, to do something new I've never done before, to think new thoughts, to hire new people, to behave differently, uh, to maybe give up control more and allow other people within the companies to, to rise up, whatever it may be. So basically, whatever my vision is, is going to require me to grow and change. And as I said, most people are very uncomfortable. Everyone watching this, you can do a little experiment. You just fold your hands like this and notice which thumb's on top. And then take your hand and move all the fingers up a notch so the other thumb comes out on top. Don't just move your thumbs, but move all the fingers. And if you do that, most people go, that feels really weird. It feels okay. awkward. It feels uncomfortable. So that's how you do that. I don't like it. Yeah. And I'll say, well, what, do you, what, what does your body want to do? And it wants to go back. Then they say, oh, how's that? Oh, that's comfortable. That feels better. And the problem is comfortable is where you are now, and it will not get you where you want to go. Because everything new, whether it's delegating more or hiring people that are smarter than me or spending money in areas I haven't spent it before or letting go of control or whatever it might be, learning new skills of communication, that's uncomfortable. And so most people are letting their comfort zone run their life rather than their vision. And so the first thing you have to do is determine, well, what is my vision? And then what am I going to have to do differently in order to get there? And, and that's, for a lot of people, scary. Because we know what works now. But I always tell people, if what, was work, if what you're doing now would get you more of what you want, the more would have already showed up. So you can't just keep doing that. You have to do something different. So, so that means people feel um, a bit guilty that I'm not working hard, I'm getting back. And not driving the car, I'm in the back seat. So that feeling of guilt sometimes prevents people to take off hard working. They, they, they regard hard working as 24-7, mind busy, hands busy. Yes. Well, that, that's what's required to start a company. Yeah. That's what entrepreneurs yeah. know. In fact, a lot of times entrepreneurs will start a company, they get bored running it, they don't really want to run it, they're really good at starting it, you know. Yeah. So then they start another company or they'll sell that company or they'll turn it over to a management team. Um, and the, the, most of the entrepreneurs I've met, they don't rest very well. They don't take good free time off. However, this is what's important. Uh, we know that the research now shows that entrepreneurs who take more time off actually become more successful because it's when you're not working so hard that you have time for creative ideas to emerge. It's when you meet other people, perhaps on vacation, perhaps out for dinner, that are from a different profession as you, and they start to look at the world through different eyes, and so you get a different perspective on your own business. You meet people that you can do joint ventures with that normally you might not meet in your day-to-day -day kind of focused on your business. Um, and the, 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 real, the real trip is you've got to determine what's my vision, where do I want to go, 
And then you have to spend a few moments every day with your eyes closed, envisioning that, meaning closing your eyes, seeing what that would look like if you got there. So, you know, my current goal right now is to sell, well, to enroll a million people in our Train the Trainer program. So by the year 2030, we will have trained a million people to teach the work I do. So every day I visualize for a few moments what it would look like if we had a million trainers and we were putting on conferences for these people around the world and we were getting reports back about all the things they're doing and I have a, a logo of what that looks like and this one in a million that we've had. So I visualize that. If I do that every day for 30 days, my unconscious mind starts to come up with creative ideas. If I'm busy all the time and I never take time to relax, to meditate, to just sit and daydream, the answers cannot emerge into consciousness because they're very, it's a very still voice, your intuition. Yeah. And that's why I'm a big believer in meditation. I think it's a wonderful thought because people are too busy working, not thinking. Yes. And uh, probably it's a sign of growth as well that you're tired of working and you want to go further because, as you said, entrepreneurs are not good at running their com companies. They're good at setting at. Right. But that's probably the entrepreneur's mind. And yes. They're always good at setting things up. Yes. But letting, and then delegating responsibility to others. So is that dele being able to delegate successfully a very key factor totally. for growth? Totally. It, it, super important. One of the most important things. And, you know, often when entrepreneurs are delegating or training other people to do what they do, they feel like they're wasting their time because they're not producing an immediate result. Mm. So you have to step back and say, okay, this isn't going to produce an immediate result, but the time I spend doing this is going to produce freedom. And freedom is what allows you to either create the new idea or to create the next business or to eventually enjoy your life. So the ability to delegate is one. What about the ability to work and open up with other people, like picking up the right, the right people? I heard one of your talks, you said that if you're thinking very creatively, intensely, you gather people of similar thoughts across the continent. Yes. And that study you presented, people in uh, space, they, yes. were, they were able to predict Yes. What people, what, tell us more about that. Sure. Well, first of all, the idea you just talked about is that every time we are thinking positive thoughts about our future, our goals, our vision, whatever, we are sending out, I call it a spam email, to everyone on the planet. It's like you're, just, you're putting a little email saying, hey, this is what I'm about. I'm starting this company or I have this goal to do this. And then anyone else who's aligned with that, who would benefit by being associated with you, who might have a similar vision as you, will start to vibrate and to be attracted toward you. In other words, if you got a real email and I said, here's something I'm doing, and you said, oh, I want to be part of that, then you'd contact me. Well, the way it works this way, a friend of mine coined the term internet instead of internet. Internet. Inner, yeah. The internet. And so what happens is, and why we know this works and isn't just woo-woo, is that a study was done that you alluded to by NASA where they had astronauts up in lunar modules rotating the moon and they were, every couple hours, they were to uh, shuffle through some envelopes that were labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Pick one at random and then open it up and in it would be a shape, maybe a square, a circle, a triangle, a pentagon, whatever. And then they would focus on that for a few minutes, just look at it or meditate on it. They had students back on Earth at uh, Duke University in the United States in the uh, psychology lab and they, at that same time, were supposed to close their eyes and see what image came to them uh, because they knew this guy was thinking about it. Now, this is 240,000 miles away. That's a lot of miles. No, <coughs> excuse me, no video, no audio. And yet, they were able to receive that image. So we know that your brain is sending out a wave, just like a radio station. <coughs> excuse me. A radio station has a, a, a radio wave, it has a carrier wave, which says this is 97.3 on your dial, but it also has another wave called the information wave, which says your voice or the music that's being played. And so what happens is that our thoughts are traveling, we know, a minimum of 240,000 miles. Yeah. So when you're thinking a thought about your business, maybe you're thinking of expanding into Japan, people in Japan are actually picking that up. Subconsciously, they don't know it, just like you don't know what's in your email inbox right now because you haven't looked. But when they're relaxed and they're sleeping, meditating, thinking, whatever, they'll find themselves being drawn to you. And you attract venture capitalists, people to do projects with, clients. You know, I now have 750,000 people, fans, on my Facebook page, almost a million people. And, you know, we now have, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, we now have, you know, 40 people from different countries coming to my seminars, no matter where I do them in the world. And all of that is because I am constantly focused on my vision. And it's not just going out through the emails, it's going out through the thought waves. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Mark Victor Hansen and I one day decided we wanted to sell a million books in one day. It had never been done. The only person that's done it since then is J.K. Rowling, when I think the fifth or sixth Harry Potter came out. And so we started visualizing that every day, a million books sold in one day. And then I was in uh, Chicago about six weeks later at a convention for booksellers and authors. And I was getting on the bus. Well, first of all, I was supposed to go back in the limousine with my publisher. I decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't know why. I just said, you guys go ahead. I'm going to stay here a little longer, which meant I had to go back by bus to get to the hotel we were staying in. So I get on the convention bus. I sit down. A woman looks at me. She says, you're Jack Canfield. And I thought, well, I'm famous. She knows who I am. <laughs> then she said, you're wearing a name tag. I can see your name tag. And she said, but you're the chicken soup for the soul guy. I said, yeah. She said, what are you and Mark up to? I said, we're up to selling a million books in one day. That's our new goal. And she said, I can help you do that. I mean, as fast as I said that, she said, I can help you do that. And I said, how's that? She said, I'm the buyer for the W.H. Smith bookstores, which were in most of the airports in America. She said, we could do book signings with all your co-authors, starting on the East Coast, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, Atlanta, Miami, and then we'll fly all of you over. You do the six to eight o'clock signings. We'll fly you to the Midwest. You go to Chicago, St. Louis, Dallas, etc., Kansas City. Then we'll fly you to the West Coast. You can do that in the evening. And she said, I bet we could sell a million books in one day. And I said, why would you help me do that? And then she said, if I sold a million books in one day through my bookstores, you don't think I'd look like a hero to my boss? I said, of course. But the point of the story is, a lot of people say, well, that was lucky. I said, no, no, that was synchronicity that was created by us having this vision. We start attracting people, opportunities, ideas into our mind, into our field. And that's what happens. You know, entrepreneurs who are what we call visionaries, the, the uh, M Michael Dells from Dell Computer, you know, the guy who started Microsoft, Bill Gates, Walt Disney, these people, or we can take political people like Mandela in Africa, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, whatever. These people, we call them visionaries because they have a vision and they can't stop thinking about it. They can't stop talking about it. And they could see a lot more. Yes. See beyond the wall. And they can see what needs to be evolved and what wants to come into, into being. Martin Luther King, the great civil rights leader in America, he started having this vision. He said, I have a dream. His famous speech was, I have a dream. And lots of people shared that dream. And all of a sudden, thousands and thousands of people said, I want to work with you. Yeah. And he attracted that. And uh, now we have an African-American president, Barack Obama. Because yeah, I think a lot more, word has to see a lot more by the way things are going. A, so, a strong brain wave has power. Yes. And I think the telepathic signs, the motherly passion can be, can, the mother can feel the agony of a child yes. miles away. Yes. So there's a science behind it. We've all had the experience of thinking about somebody, and then a minute later, the phone rings and it's them. How do we know? Yeah. Either they were sending their intention, thinking about calling us, and we picked it up, or we started thinking about them, and then they felt that and they called us. As you said, par parents will get, I've seen this in, 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 in America where a mother will wake up at two in the morning and go, something happened to our son. Yeah. And then that next day she'll find out he was wounded in Afghanistan or something like that. Yeah. How do we know? We've all had the experience of being stared at. We turn around and we see someone staring at us. Yeah. How do we know? We felt it. So yeah. th there's a science behind it. It's not just a whim say. It's actually, there's, it's a practical thing. It can right. happen. It has happened to you. Right. I have experienced that. Many of uh, the viewers would have, would have done so. So, so this is an ability to think very clearly, strongly, passionately, and with a vision. Yeah. Let me add one more thing to that. There's a, an American named uh, John Hagelin. He's a physicist, okay. and he was in the movie The Secret, which I appeared in as well. And he shared, I think, a really important piece of data. He said. The power of an intention, an intention creates a force field. My intention is the one. But if you and I have the same intention, two times two is four, our intention is four. So the power of a force field of an intention is the square of the number of people holding the same intention at the same time. 
So part of my job as a leader in a company or an entrepreneur is to enroll as many people as possible to hold the same vision. And when we all hold the same vision, then the, the power of that is, is exponential. That's, that's important to realize. So if you can get 100 people all thinking the same goal, the same intention. In one company. In one company. The power of that is 10,000. And that creates a, creates a great atmosphere of creation. You know? Yes, exactly. People can get together, think together, work together. Yeah, and you look at a company like Virgin Airlines. One of, one of, one of uh, Richard Branson's great talents is that he's able to create a vision and then he, he'll get dressed up like in an astronaut suit if he's going to do Virgin Galactic and then he gets everyone in the company thinking that thought and all working together. And so what happens is that force field becomes something that the whole society picks up on. So it's critical to have everyone thinking Jack, way. it's very interesting what you just said because people have felt it but they never had words put it to it. Right. And you've said it very clearly in a very succinct way. You felt it and you are an example of that. Right. Uh, so the leaders have to have um, ability to think clearly. They have to take risk as well. Yes. Where would you put that? Well, risk is very important. You know, nothing risk, nothing gained. Uh, the problem with most people, again, is risk feels like this. They don't want to get out of their comfort zone. Uh, but, you know, I think the thing that's, that's great about most entrepreneurs is they're willing to take risks. Risk with their time, with their money, their reputation, all of that. The problem is, again, what creates a conservative is that you, there's the word conserve. You now have a lot of stuff, you want to conserve it. You don't want to lose it. And so people often become less risk-taking as they become older or they have more to protect. Uh, unfortunately, that then stops their growth. So we have to continually continue to take risks. Well, I think this is really interesting that you put it very clearly that people who are ready to grow, they feel uneasy with the present job. They won't be happy. Either if, if people call them successful, but they won't call themselves successful. Right. Is that the sign? to actually stop driving and get in the back seat? Well, if you're unhappy, it's a sign to stop doing what you're doing, whatever it is. So it could be get in the back seat and let someone else drive. It could be get in a different car. <laughs> it could be maybe you need to walk now. You know, whatever it is, metaphorically. Uh, but I think, you know, I believe that joy is your internal guidance system. Just like you have a GPS in your car, if you take the wrong turn, it says, please make an immediate U-turn and return to the highlighted route, right? And so often what happens, we stop feeling joy. And if you stop feeling joy, like for me, I was doing chicken soup for the soul for about 15 years, and all of a sudden it stopped being fun. Stories that should have inspired me no longer inspired me. And I said, I think I'm done doing this for a while. And so we sold the company, and I started doing the success principles. And I'm, I'm happy now that I'm training other people how to be more successful. In other words, I, I became a super success, and I wanted to share with others how to do that. I mean, we have a brand that, with Chicken Soup, it's a brand that's worth about $100 million. And uh, it's now, I mean, we, the, the new company we sold it to, our dog food brand alone, is making them about uh, half a million dollars a month. Wow. You know, so we have chicken soup for the pet lovers, soul, dog food, and cat food, and very successful in the United States. So, but that was no longer, it just no longer made me happy. And so it was called, I can keep doing it because there's a lot of money, but I'm not growing. I'm kind of becoming dead. And so we sold that. And uh, now with my, the Campfield Training Group, going around doing trainings like we're doing here in London, um, that excites me. That's exciting. So if that stops being fun, then I'll stop yeah. doing that. I think this is this is what what you just really summed up very well. That if you if the thing that doesn't excite you anymore, the one which uh, took you off, right. you've got to think that it is something you want to do more. And uh, you are an example of that. You shifted from a very successful business to another successful business, right. and you said you stopped uh, getting excited by chicken soup for the soul. Right. So this is a telltale of, and you have inspired millions, and I think you will probably inspire a lot more. And with your energy, I've seen you walk today all the way up with me. You, you, walk, you walk faster than me, you know, I was behind you. <laughs> so well done for that. And uh, I hope you have a great time in London. It's a bit warmer this time, but uh, it's probably the weather unpredictable. Tomorrow you may be walking in a big jersey outside in, in the road. So I wish you well. I hope you have a great time here. And I really enjoyed talking to you today. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. That's a short, short time for... Jack, I think uh, I need 24-7 talking to him. I won't be even happy that, that for that long time. Jack, thank you. We'll have more of you tomorrow. And thank you all. Thank you.